Now the fun begins. Budget. Stop! You violated the law. Welcome back to another episode of the Game Pass GameCast, your weekly go-to podcast for all things Xbox, Xbox Game Pass, and of course, PC gaming, including news, rumors, and conversation around them damn good video games. You can catch new episodes of the show when they drop each and every Friday morning on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and all other major podcast services. So be sure to subscribe to us, rate us, review us, all that jazz, wherever you get a podcast at. If we're not on there, let me know. I'll get us on there, you know. And, of course... Follow us on Twitter at GPGC Podcast to stay up to date with everything regarding the show, video games like and our dope giveaways. I, of course, am your host as always, Travis White, aka Travelis, on most internet platforms. Joining me as always, the voices in my head, you know, my inner monologue. It's just me today. Um, this is, I, if I'm being quite blunt and quite honest, there's a little behind the scenes you know, inside baseball stuff going on, uh, IRL. Uh, my life this week is f- crazy, fucking crazy. Uh, and Mike's is too. Mike's adjusting to a new job and whatnot. Um, and he's had a little bit of, you know, with training and different things like that. He's kind of been all over the place as well. Um, and with my IRL job, you know, in <laughs> I should say IRL job, but my, uh, my full-time gig, obviously, uh, it is one of the weeks that is it's the, our busiest week of the of the year easily. Um, if you don't know, I work in college athletics, uh, and it is uh, and I I can't talk too much about it, but uh, with it being a big time of the uh, college athletic year, if you catch my drift and a certain big thing going on right now, uh, my job is. In, may be involved with that. Um, so uh, it is very hectic for this week. Um, after this week, it will go well back to normal. And Mike will be back. I'll be back to normal. We'll, we'll all be good. Um, but this week is just absolutely hectic. I'm recording this <laughs> on a Tuesday at like 930 by myself. Uh, so we're all just kind of all over the place this week. So but I want to make sure I got on talk to you guys this week. Um because there were a few things that kind of popped up, but one specifically I really did want to talk about because I really think it's interesting as we're starting to kind of crack this nut of it a little bit. Um, but in general, before we kind of get into that, just kind of as we always talk about, you know, obviously, no matter what, whether it's just me, the voices in my head, uh, or Mike here, or whoever that we have on the show, um, I always have to start off, you know, what's good, what's going on, and what you've been playing. Um, but already kind of summed up to what I've been doing. What have I, how am I, you know, <laughs> right now I'm okay. Ask me in like a couple days once the madness uh, of a certain month uh, finally starts to quell, at least on my end or my duties with it. Um, I'll feel a lot better. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll, I'll be much more normal. But I, uh, but in terms of what I've been playing, at least up until the past couple days ago before life got crazy, um, hardcore and Elden Ring still. Um, I think my character now is over the 100 level mark, but I've also been doing more critical path, golden path, like uh, where I've been focusing more on not like, oh, I want to wrap this up. Oh, I want to, you know, be done with this more or less. So I want to get to a point where (laughs) and I know I've talked about this before, but like I always feel obligated. I don't want to say I feel obligated to beat a game or start a game, but more so a game that I love and I hate. That I, I hate that I'm at that I'm that type of person that like oh sometimes like oh I need to buy the new release or whatever I get like that sure because I just fucking love playing a bunch of different stuff and I don't necessarily want to wait um but there are some things that I'm like ah, I could wait I I don't need to play it right now but naturally this past month we've gotten Horizon Zero Dawn or Horizon Zero Dawn Horizon Forbidden West um obviously PlayStation won't get into that too much but Horizon Forbidden West uh. Destiny, the Witch Queen expansion for Destiny 2, which I'm huge in Destiny 2, and then, obviously, Elden Ring. Um, And (laughs) Elden Ring derailing both of those, literally, especially Elden Ring being fucking two days after Witch Queen came out. Uh, But, 
And really, what? I think Forbidden West came out the week before Elden Ring? I'll have to look at that. Um, uh, but yeah, Forbidden West, I think, was a week before that. But if not, it was, it, we had, like, not long. Um, it, so it, it really wasn't, like, there was just no chance. No chance I was going to beat any of those outside of, because Elden Ring was just going to just completely get in the way of that. Um, but... So it's not that I'm like, oh man, I want to be done, but more or less like, I want to see the, I want to see this to the end with this character. I want to kind of get there, um, but or at least get there, make a save before that, then beat the game, and then come back to it, kind of thing, uh, and do the rest of my exploring or whatever, and you know, not do a, a hard cap ending kind of thing. But I digress. That's most. That's what I've been playing. Um, I really haven't dug too much into, like, I've dipped my toe back in Destiny, but I know once I get into Destiny, that's all I'm going to be playing. Like, there's no, like, that's the thing with Destiny. I'm either all in or I'm taking a break. Like, or there's, I'm not really touching it. Like, I, I'm not jumping in just to do a few things. It's like, I'm grinding Destiny or I'm not. <laughs> um, so I I don't want to really touch on it too much just for the sole fact of, like, I know I'll, I'll I know I'll get into that. Like I know I'm gonna have my time in the sun with Destiny uh, with the Witch Queen expansion here soon, but my full focus is still on Elden Ring. It's just such a good game. <laughs> it's incredible, man, and I can't get over what From Software has been able to do from not just an evolution of their formula, but really an evolution. I know that we talk about for the past couple of weeks. Also, shout out to everyone other because we've had a bunch of new listeners come through, uh, especially which I expected with our Elden Ring review. Um, shout out to everyone who's come through on that. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, or if you're a returning listener, um, or, you know, lapsed listener, whatever, you know, glad to have you back. If you've been listening before, obviously in our, you know, community who listens every week and whatnot and shows us support, you're the best. Um, but really, you know, a shout out and a warm welcome to all those who are now, you know, jumping in for the first couple times into the show. Um, thank you, everyone, for giving us a chance and coming in. And we hope that you feel welcome to this community. Um, a lot of dope people who listen to the show right in, whatever. You know, we're really thankful for that. So um, welcome. And thank you for checking us out. Uh, but sorry, I meant to mention that last week. But um, but really what From Software has been able to do from just taking the open world formula and really kind of, I, I want to say evolve it for, and not just a, from a buzzword perspective, but really taking that formula and just cracking it open, like the open world formula of what do people like from a lot of these big budget, you know, narrative heavy third person, you know, triple a open world games. Um, do you see from Sony that you see from Nintendo, um, you know, with, the formula that Zelda's taking on now with Breath of the Wild. You know, what are some things from there that they really succeeded with, with taking a game that traditionally isn't open world or, you know, what the modern sense of an open world is and, you know, what they were able to do, take a franchise from that and take it to that new, you know, model of game. What was great with that transition? What did they do well? How can we apply that same ideology of, hey, we have this, formula that a lot of people like but we always want to tr we want to expand upon it we want to want they are very much perfectionist in the sense of we want to one-up ourselves we're not we're not complacent and i think that's one of the things i admire about from software even when i wasn't necessarily playing their games a lot before or you know really wanted to give uh dark souls a chance it was knowing that okay each one of these games that they put out is uniquely it, it, it has its own fingerprint within the gaming landscape. It was very much of if you're playing Dark Souls original or remastered, whichever you know version of the game you want to play, compared to Demon Souls, compared to Dark Souls two, compared to Dark Souls three, compared to Bloodborne, compared to Sekiro, like these games all feel uniquely different. Whether it's from the speed, whether it's from the um, the weight of the game, whether it's from the combat mechanics, they have a uniqueness each to them, but they also still have, it's very much that family-esque feeling of, you know, there is this underlying tie that connects all of you, but you are uniquely whole to yourself. And I think that's really unique, but it's really cool to see them take that formula and take that ideology that you've seen from A Breath of the Wild, so that you've seen from, you know, what so many people have enjoyed about these mainstream AAA big budget 
open world action adventure titles or open world RPGs even. Um, you know, what do people like with the explorability of Breath of the Wild, Elder Scrolls, Fallout even? Um, you know, what are people like? What do people like even with, you know, looking at Gorilla with Horizon Zero Dawn? What do people... I think even has elements of something like a death death stranding in there and the ambiance of that and what so many people enjoyed about that where it necessarily wasn't, you know, always about combat. And yeah, Souls games are always very much from software games in general, very much reliant on this is, you know, challenging combat. But at the same time, too, there's beauty in finding these quiet moments that you get. And, you know. Death Stranding did that ridiculously well. Uh, and Kojima, I think, is such an interesting and fascinating, you know, I want to say, I don't want to say creative genius because I think that's hyperbolic and, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, my God, you know. But I think there's a reason why so many fu- people find him so wholly unique and so just <sighs> struggling to find a way to phrase this. I don't want to sound like, oh, my God, incredible. There's no other... But he's wholly unique in his approach to game design and, you know, being able to, once again, leave that fingerprint on so much of his own material. Um, and I think that's I, not to we've talked about Dark, or <laughs> Dark Souls. We talked about Own Ring so much over the past couple of weeks. I don't want to necessarily harp on it forever. You know, we're not going to become a from software podcast or anything like that. Um but in general, though, uh, that is what I've been playing. But I, you know, it just each each time I boot this game up, I find something different that really catches me off guard or makes me say, "Oh, that's cool," or "That's so clever," or something like that. That how they handle certain open world aspects, certain certain explorability things, and you know, environmental storytelling. Really, which From Software's been so fucking good with forever. Um, it just ratcheted up to a new level. And I'm I'm excited to see the end of this journey. It's going to be bittersweet, obviously. But knowing that, hey, I'm going to try to make a save right before that, that I want to carry this character on, um, you know, before I go on to the final boss. Because I know how, how I'm going to be getting there. Um, so, to me, it's, it's going to be that almost Avengers Endgame moment of, you know, you want to see how it ends, but you're... You know, you're sad to see the journey of these specific characters or, you know, my character in this case come to an end because it's been so memorable. And it's going to be one of those games that I look back on that I have so many, you know, I've had with so many memories that are these kind of moments in time of my gaming history that I'm like, man, I wish I could experience that for the first time again. The build up with Elden Ring, the mystique of Elden Ring, kind of like the build up with God of War, the build up with Spider-Man, the build up with Breath of the Wild, the build up with Halo Infinite, like th- these are going to be these moments in time that I'm going to look back on personally and be like, man, that's such a time capsule moment, uh, and you know, within my DNA of gaming, that God, I wish I could just bottle that up and just fucking experience it, <laughs> almost like in Harry Potter, where you know, in in, in I fucking love Harry Potter, um, but in the I believe it was well, the sixth one was whenever it really started to get. Um, they really started focusing in on it more, but being able to experience others' memories um, in the... Uh, I, why, at the top of my head, I can't remember. But you know what I'm talking about. In the sixth book, movie, whichever one you prefer to uh, uh, you know, take in, the when Harry was experiencing Dumbledore's memories uh, for himself, it, much like that, that I wish I could just fucking have that. Like, man, I want to wipe my brain. Or even like Eternal Shock... Uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Jim Carrey movie, um, that that idea of like erasing a moment or a person or something in your mind and being able to like pay to get that done, I would do that with so many games to be like, fuck, I just want to experience them again. <laughs> Anyways, though, before I drag on too long about that, because I can fucking talk about that stuff, man. That's that's like one of those ones that's just like, fuck, crack a beer. Let's just bullshit, man. It, 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 it's kind of one of those nights, I guess. But uh, in general, though, let's hop into the topic I did want to talk about, because I think it is really interesting and kind of poignant to bring up, because this is, I would like to think, a tentpole title and definitely a tentpole studio right now in the future plans of Microsoft. That It's really interesting because a lot of people, you know, 
at the basis, you know, things do happen. Things do. These are people at the end of the day who are making games. Um, and a story like this doesn't necessarily like, you know, it shouldn't always alarm people because there's life. And sometimes people is it's more than just, you know, people read the tea leaves sometimes too much on things and where it could be taken more at face value. But it is interesting when it's this heavily, the turnover is this heavily and, and what I'm talking about is the reports that are coming out out of uh, VGC Video Game Chronicle. Uh, they did a report recently, Andy Robinson over there, who does fantastic work. Go over there, check out all of Andy's work um, that's now been making circles around the uh, games media community and publications and whatnot. But it's this idea that, or what's going on in this report, that as much as half of the core development team on Perfect Dark over at the Initiative have left or resigned or moved on or, you know, um, and it's really interesting to see from a perspective of like how excited a lot of people were when it was like, and a lot of people expected, Hey, the initiative they're hinting from what everybody's hinting at Phil Spencer, the initiative, um, everyone in Microsoft who's involved very much in all the leaks of like, not leaks, but like, people finding a perfect dark Twitter account that was owned by Microsoft that like was deactivated or was pretty much a placeholder and this and that, like a lot of people were really excited when they finally found out of, Hey, they're rebooting perfect dark. They're taking this new spin on this. It's going to be heavily, you know, this, what is now being viewed as a quadruple a, you know, title that's coming out um, that's being built around my uh, that's being kind of built around as a tentpole title from Microsoft, you know, so there's really a lot of people were really excited for it. And it's interesting now to kind of see, you know, just the turmoil turmoil that's kind of come around from a, you know, in the turnover aspect of this, it's kind of coming out with the initiative that was kind of built from the ground up to be this, hey, we want this to be eventually, you know, and of course, Microsoft's not necessarily come out and said this directly, but Obviously, Microsoft is going in so many different directions and wanting to have really a line out in each pond that they're fishing in um, to say that, you know, they do touch that. Hey, we, you want this? We have this. And clearly, the initiative was built to be that Naughty Dog S studio, that, you know, Nintendo R&D studio that is, um, you know, pumping out the Zelda's Mario's, the, you know, uh, Last of Us, Uncharted's, even, you know, from the standpoint of a, you know, Gorilla or Insomniac, um, you know, that that type or that kind of studio that is really going to be your people are getting on this plat or getting on your ecosystem, your platform for this specific reason. And very much they were wanting that to be, you know, the initiative and what this team was building around with perfect art. Um, and obviously that's still in play. That's still happening. They're still moving forward with that. Um, but I do want to read a little bit from the article, uh, just to kind of set the pace and kind of set the scene of what's going on that Andy wrote up. It's really interesting. Uh, as always, the link will be in the description, go, go down there, give Andy a click. Um, he did really good work on this. Um, and it's really interesting to kind of look at this. So like I said, insiders described fast and furious exits from Xbox Perfect Dark Studio. Like I said, as much as half of the core development team has quit in the past year, even though the initiative's management says it's, quote, confident in its team. Xbox is the initiative studio has seen a fast, quote, fast and furious wave of senior departures in the past 12 months, VGC has learned. As much as has, half of the core development team known to be working on the upcoming Perfect Dark reboot quit the company during the last year or around 34 people. Anal uh, analysis of employee LinkedIn profiles have revealed. That includes most of the initiative's senior design team, including game director Dan Neuenberg, direct designer Drew Murray, lead level designer Chris O'Neill, principal world uh, builder Jolon uh, Myers, two senior systems or designers, a group of three former God of War design God of War designers and more. Sorry if I'm a little like slurring over my words. Long, long day at work. <laughs> I'm trying to get through the best I can. And the turnover of top talent doesn't end in design. Perfect Dark's two most senior writers also quit recently. Analysis shows, along with the project's technical director, tech art director, lead gameplay engineer, lead animator, QA lead, and more. 
According to LinkedIn, the initiative is now less than 50 people when duplicates, former employees, and erroneous listings are removed, and currently has just three roles advertised on its website. Analysts suggest it's hired around 12 people in the past 12 months. The timing of the departures coincides with the September 2021 announcement that Crystal Dynamics has signed uh, has been signed to co-develop Perfect Dark. This, combined with the few jobs uh, job roles currently advised at the initiative, su- advertised at the initiative, sorry, suggests that the Tomb Raider developer is likely taking a much stronger lead than first thought on the project. Interviews with multiple for- former senior developers cited a lack of creative anatomy, autonomy and slow development process as the reason for their departures, and described the wave of exits as, quote, fast and furious, with project momentum said to be heavily affected. The initiative's management told VGC it's confident in its team in the team it has in place and new talent joining and pointed to industry-wide staffing challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic. Quote, it's no small task to build a studio and reinvent a beloved franchise studio head, Daryl Gallagher told VGC. In creating the initiative, we set out to leverage co-developed partners, uh, partnerships to achieve our ambitions, and we're really excited about all the progress we're seeing with our relationship with uh, with our relationship with Crystal Dynamics. In this journey, it's not uncommon for there to be staffing changes, especially during a time of global upheaval over the past two years, and there's plenty more work in front of us to deliver a fantastic Perfect Dark experience to our players. We wish all of our former colleagues the best, and I'm confident in the team we have in place, the new talent joining, and I can't wait to share more with the fans. In the games industry, competition for experienced talent is at an all-time high following a pandemic-fueled gaming boom, and unhappy initiative staff would likely have had plenty of alternate alternate uh, employment opportunities at the large num- numbering of neighboring AAA studios in California. Across the industry, studios are currently facing a talent crisis with the sheer level of expansion and investment in the scene, uh, sector making it a challenge for even the biggest studios to retain and attract senior staff. The former initiative developers VGC spoke to attributed the wave of departures to frustration among senior talent over the direction of the project set down by Gallagher and game director Dan Neuenberg, uh, who himself left the company last month. Although the initiative's website claims that the company promotes a, quote, collaborative creative environment, former employees describe the studio's development hierarchy as very top down, with Gallagher and Neuenberg keeping a strong grasp on creative decisions. According to former the former employees, many senior team members were frustrated by this perspective or perceived lack of autonomy and didn't feel heard on key issues such as development priorities, project planning, and steam, team staffing. Gallagher and Neuenberg, who were previously studio heads and game directors at Crystal Dynamics, wanted to make games the way that they always had with top-down direction, the sources said, while many initiative employees were expecting a more bottom-up approach. As a result, it's claimed that the development has progressed or progressed painfully slow and a solid company culture never formed. All former employees VGC spoke to said that they were surprised at how lenient Microsoft has been with over the lack of progress. One person said, quote, making games is hard enough, let alone when you feel like you can't get through to people that are to people making the decisions that affect everyone. The culture in issue with partially or partly Partly, I'm sorry, uh, behind the decision to bring on board Crystal Dynamics, it's claimed, with Gallagher and Neuenberg allegedly hoping that production would move more smoothly with the introduction of a second team familiar with their methods. Crystal Dynamics' introduction is also now likely to plug the gaps left by the initiative staff turnover VGC was told. VGC sources agreed that they would be surprised if Crystal Dynamics' introduction, combined with the significant departures of its core staff, hadn't triggered an effective soft reboot of Perfect Dark, and that it was likely still years away from a release. It's understood that Xbox's leadership teams are prepared to be patient with their new first-party teams, uh, which includes those currently working on Playgrounds Fable and Rares Everwild, as these prior, uh, as they prioritize assembling groups of capable of regularly producing the kind of critically acclaimed prestige projects that come from PlayStation Studios like Naughty Dog and Insomniac. So, yeah, like I said, a l- lot to dig into there, a lot of meat on that bone. Um, but it's really interesting to kind of see, not only, I thought it was really interesting, the point about Microsoft being so lenient with the um, the current you know, pace that this game's developing at, because we've heard from so many people, uh, you know, not knowing from the inside or anything like that, but so many people speculating on, hey, when is this game coming out? When, what is the deal with Perfect Dark? Is this a, you know, are we going to see this in 
an episodic or released in, you know, waves or something like that? Is it going to be this, you know, release that's put out that is very much, you know, you're going to face, you know, various campaigns of this. This is going to be an evolving, a live service, you know, approach to, you know, the single player narrative experience, you know, what's going on with this game? Uh, and when is it coming out? You know, we, we've now seen, you know, parts of it and granted, I think a lot of people also understood that, or at least people who are familiar with the development of games, or at least who are very much, you know, I don't want to say gamers, you know, but very much in tune with the games industry and regularly play games who are interested in the inside baseball aspect of games. A lot of people understood, okay, 2018, they're announcing the initiative. That's going to be their new, you know, big quadruple A studio, as they're now calling it. That's from the ground up. 2018 to, you know, we're at 2022 now, and we're really talking, you know, almost four years since that announcement. You know, it's a little different to expect, you know, a product out the door four years down the road. That just doesn't happen, especially in today's day and age of game development. You're not seeing these traditionally quick, you know, just churning out, you know, quick licensed product kind of like, you, which you typically see, you know, uh, you know, we had to do this game in 12 months or we had to do this game in less than that or, you know, somehow get this game out the door in 18 months. You don't see that now, especially on the large scale AAA end um, and first party end where you're seeing now so many, at least on the console side, obviously, with exclusives being so driven to we have to have critically acclaimed content. That's what's driving the specifically single player narrative driven content that's what we're seeing exclude that's what we're seeing moves the needle with exclusives i mean you're seeing it with the evolution of halo where we're seeing that become more of not all not that halo wasn't a narrative experience before i love the narrative of halo personally i love the lore of halo i think it's really interesting um but very much more of a cinematic experience that's coming in um with halos op and obviously adopting open world people wanting more meat in their content um and a longer time to play than, uh, you know, more of an investment, I guess, with the content that they're getting and seeing that that moves the needle, needle as well. You're seeing that, you saw that with Halo as well. So we're seeing this more kind of evolve into that. And it's really interesting, though, to think that, you know, Microsoft saying, okay, yeah, that's this. We clearly see the writing on the wall right now of not like, hey, this is done, this is over with, but there's clearly, you know, there are some growing pains with the studio and not that I thought anybody would think that there weren't, but it seems like it hasn't been as turnkey as possible. Um, it's one thing to be a fable to go from, you know, from a studio like playground games who has been consistently making banger after banger after banger in terms of the Forza franchise um, with her. They're specifically the horizon Forza horizon franchise. Um, but Somebody who has been up and running, has a studio culture, has a design philosophy, I'm sure, has certain methods of uh, game design that they're using, that they're being you know, bringing people on, especially from a senior end who, you know, buy into that and mesh well with that approach. That's very different when you're doing that. In short, it, I'm sure there still are, you know, growing changes as we're going from a, you know, this being this studio that's a hotbed for racing titles, specifically more of the arcade experience compared to, you know, the traditional mainline Forza uh, franchise of simulation. But this is much more of an arcade open world approach, kind of, you know, obviously being a spinoff. But interesting to kind of, you know, there's going to be obviously some hurdles to take from transitioning with that. But that transition to me is going to be a lot smoother comparative to it or in terms of it's going to be, yeah, it's a change of pace, but it's much more it's already up and running. It's kind of shifting the track for the train that's already going compared to starting up the train. And there's a lot of value in starting up the train, um, because once you get it going, you know, and if it's running great, it's running great and it'll run all day. But it's also chucking in the coal. It's also this is such like a boomer reference, I'm sure, because, you know, nobody fucking cares about look. <laughs> I don't know why I thought it trade, but it, it does fit that um, 
you know, it does take a while to get up and running, and it's not going zero to 100 right away. But once it does get up and running, it usually runs pretty damn well. So it's it's interesting to see them have this much. And granted, it's probably because of you look at their portfolio right now. I mean, look at the fact that I have to pull up right now uh, the first party lineup of Xbox Studios because it's so fucking dense now. <laughs> like just looking at this three for three uh activision blizzard alpha dog arcane um bethesda game studios that is the coalition compulsion games double fine the initiative id software in exile machine games mojang uh ninja theory obsidian playground games rare roundhouse studios tango work games turn tent undead labs uh world's edge uh xbox uh what is it uh fucking Microsoft Flight Simulator. Fuck, what was it? Uh, what the fuck can't I think of it? Fucking um, uh, Asobo. Yeah, but granted, they're not first party, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, and then obviously ZeniMax Online for um, Elder Scrolls Online. Like, the fact that I had to roll through all of that. <laughs> um, but I think it's a lot easier to accept those, you know, hey bumps along the way these you know what's going on when you compare it to hey don't worry we have a you know catalog of you know well over 25 you know uh, first party studios like that we're churning out content for um especially ones like activision and bethesda or activision blizzard and bethesda when you bring those entities in that already have mainstay hits and fucking huge franchises on themselves namely call of duty elder scrolls uh fallout um fucking doom and i almost said quake which i don't know about that uh, i mean quake's getting there don't worry i i think i'm we're primed to see quake again um but it's funny and also too it's funny to see that we're also just got a report too of for E3 2022 show if well granted I don't I don't even think of E3 is really happening this year but Microsoft Summer Game Showcase from over granted different author over uh, Jordan Midler who does great work that we pull from VGC um, also was reporting on uh, Jeff Grubb bringing up that uh, he's heard that Perfect Dark could come out in 2023 but Definitely could get bumped to 2024, no problem. And the more we kind of read this report, it sounds like it, but that it's also going to be shown at E3 2022 or Microsoft Summer Game Showcase that isn't really that if there isn't, which I don't think there's going to be an E3 this year, which I'm being honest, I totally, <laughs> we will see. Um, but point being that it's interesting to see kind of what Microsoft un thinks of this narrative right now with Perfect Dark, that they're giving them the space. If they think they're ready enough to go, they could be ready. Hey, you know, if you were ready to show what you guys have of this vision, sure, let's go. Or, okay, you know what? We have all this content that's being pushed out. We don't need this out. We're more concerned about getting this one right. We're more concerned about making sure we'll bite the bullet. We have the cash. And Microsoft has the boatloads of Scrooge McDuck money like Nintendo that, hey, we could sit on this for a while. Like, sure, we want to get this out as soon as possible. Yeah, we want to, but we want, we see what, we see what critically acclaimed games do compared to just having tons of content. We got to make sure that content's good. Yeah, look at Netflix. It's like when they have, look at their subscription rates because it all funnels back into Game Pass. That is their new next gen quote unquote but current gen system realistically it's just how you play or it how it's just how you receive that content in is in a you know uh modular fashion now of how you want to approach it like a pc almost but the real thing is the next gen console is the platform ecosystem of xbox through game pass um but the um but you look at that the, why they don't want to necessarily look at netflix at the same time, look at how Netflix approaches. Subscription rates go through the roof when a Stranger Things comes out, when, um, you know, uh, Ozarks or whatever, you know, things like that. They're these 
power hitters and when they get content like and people get hyped about content like uh knives out too and the knives out franchise being now exclusive you know exclusively published or produced i should say through netflix like things like that it, it it's interesting to see that like the correlation of that and how you know critically acclaimed content and things that people are passionate about and have time and care put into them can ca- compared to just hey is it like Netflix really was for a lot of years hey we just have tons of shit on Netflix like sure you may find some good but who the fuck knows you know it's more about having this like what's the word I'm looking for more of a like I uh, like cult, not culture but like hand picked selection of games than necessarily everything in the kitchen sink. Grand, they have a lot of stuff on there. Don't get me wrong, but it all comes down to we're more, they're having kind of their cake and eating it too in a sense of like, hey, the, with we could have the initiative, like we have the flexibility financially to sit on this. It all comes back to we want to drive people into Game Pass. And while we have tons of great stuff from third parties, all of our back catalogs and stuff, we know what's going to long-term drive this. And it's, bringing all of this incredibly dense and critically acclaimed content. And if we need to sit on that for a while to get that, we'll sit on that. We'll bite the bullet. We we know what works best at the end of the day. Like, And we've seen it proven with all the success that Sony's had with their, you know, narrative, critically acclaimed third-person action or action-adventure games over-the-shoulder, you know, narrative-driven titles in, in their exclusives. We've seen that. Spider-Man, uh, God of War, Horizon Zero Dawn, or Horizon in general, I should say. I keep saying Zero Dawn just because I've said it for so long. <laughs> um, but just so many fucking titles that have just knocked it out of the park. And even from a third-party standpoint, you look at somebody like Rockstar. Like, we've been talking about GTA. We've been playing GTA Five now for almost a decade. Almost a decade. And we're for sure going to be playing it for a decade before GTA Six comes out. But you look at you look at what they've done since then. Red Dead Redemption Two that took you know forever to develop, and it's because they've had no. Granted, a lot of shitty things that happened to get there along the way in terms of you know crunch culture and whatnot. But point being, though, they still had years to develop this content, and look at what happened. These games remained just, just fucking massive for so long, and. Granted, now the hype is palpable for GTA 6, and granted, not everything could be a GTA, but point being, though, the more you look at these, in you know, Nintendo, even, my God, like, <laughs> there's games that they've had been, like, sitting in the bank now for how long that have basically been done that people, like, it, like worst-kept secret kind of things that know that they're sitting there waiting, but they're like, well, we have all of this fucking cash on hand, like, realistically... We can we can hold this out if it makes more sense to to not let our releases, you know, stumble over each other. You know, we don't want to release something and then a month later release something else from one of our other studios that could cannibalize the other one. Uh, we want to have a Kirby title have the space away from the next Mario game, the next Zelda game, so that it isn't overshadowed by that. And maybe they could both make tons of money and make, you know, have you know, more favorable scores or try something different and let it have its space to breathe out, you know, away from the big juggernaut that's down the road. Um, And I think that is really beneficial to this scenario with Perfect Dark. When you look at it, you look at coming out down the road, Starfield, you look at Redfall, you look at, um, you know, I'm sure more content eventually coming to Halo Infinite, even though if Mike was here, he would, he would say otherwise. Um, But, all of these things that are coming in the next year, not to mention, eventually, we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Forza Motorsport 8. Uh, what else? Just tons of stuff that's coming down the pipeline for them that we know is in the works that eventually is going to be, you know, ready to go within the next year. And then hell, after that, Elder Scrolls 6 whatever fallouts you know whatever's next from fallout uh i'm sure the next doom title something from i keep wanting to say quake hell something from quake probably um all of these titles contraband um that are coming eventually that 
gives space to these games that are these big, hopefully going to be new tentpole titles for Microsoft from their first party um, internally, like A Perfect Dark, like, you know, the reboot of Fable from Playground Games, like uh, Everwild that has been from what we got reports last year of that being rebooted and kind of from the ground up built back up of, hey, we're changing direction on this title. We like the idea and the world and whatnot, but we want to take this in a different approach kind of thing. So I, this is cause for concern to a degree that very much so when you have, you're building up a studio when you're looking for, and this is just me talking and this is somebody who, you know, has worked in the corporate setting for a while. This is somebody who works in a team setting for a while and knowing that when you see that high a percentage of turnover, that's not a great thing. That also says something about your leadership as well. And that's not saying, you know, I, I don't know Dan Neuenberg personally. I don't know, um, uh, what's his name? Why am I blanking on this now? Um, Daryl Gallagher. Like, I don't, I don't know them personally. I don't, I haven't worked for them. I haven't, I don't know their management philosophy, but it sounds like it is, like they're saying, very top down. Some people don't, you know, work well with that. And also, too, in 2022, people are also coming to, and this isn't a bit like soapbox thing, staying on, you know, talking about this, but people are smartening up to the fact of, no, the, you know, realistically, at the end of the day, as we've saw, seen with the pandemic, it's really, the 99%, the, you know, the worker who really has all the power at the end of the day, who deserves a fair shake and is understandable of, okay, if I'm not being lessened, I know my value, I know my worth, I'm going somewhere else, I'm going where that worth will be found, or I'm going to put that own worth in my, I know what I'm worth, I'm going to do it myself, or whatever, you know, however, you, whether it's independent game, game development, or going to a different studio, or starting a new studio, like, whatever. People know their worth, and that's a little different compared to, you know, maybe six years ago in game development. And game development is ridiculously hard. I'm learning that firsthand with, you know, the 3D art that I'm doing, as well as some of the very hobbyist kind of learning of design and, um, you know, actual development of from a programming in and whatnot. But from... This, as somebody who's excited for this game, you know, I personally was, okay, when I when I heard they brought on Crystal Dynamics, I was like, sure, that works for me. Like, because that says also, too, I want to make sure that I'm not giving, I'm giving my team a chance to breathe. I'm giving my team a chance to still take the lead on this project, obviously, and control this. But we could also, if we can use, you know, some of our, you know, quote unquote friends down the down the road at Crystal Dynamics to handle some of more of not the monotonous, but more of the kind of secondary things while we could focus more big picture with our internal studio that can get this game out a little bit quicker if it remains our vision and whatnot. Sure, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that, I don't think. But hearing this does cast a different tale a little bit. Um and it all does come from management. I knew about Drew Murray leaving um, just because I'm a big fan of his design work uh, at Insomniac for a long time. Uh, I was a big fan of uh, Sunset Overdrive and uh, what he was doing at Insomniac. So I'm really excited to see what he does. He actually went back to Insomniac. So I'm excited to see what he does with not only um, the Spider-Man franchise and uh now Wolverine coming out and whatnot. I'm sure he'll have somewhat of a little bit of a hand in Spider-Man 2 and potentially Wolverine with um, with Insomniac with Marvel. So really excited about that. Um, but anyways, speaking on this, I, I am a little concerned with where this project's going. Not in the sense of, oh, we don't know. Oh, we have to soft reboot it. That to me says, that's okay. Like, you don't have a vision for it? Cool. If you have a different vision from it, you're, I would rather them say, shit, we're not confident about what we're putting out now or we have questions about it. Cool. Let's go back to the drawing board because that's honest. Me as a consumer, me as a, somebody who is a fan of video games for 29 years of my life now, honesty, upfront, transparency, that to me, 
I value in my games. Because usually at the end of the day, when you're no bullshit about stuff and you are honest with your developers and you're honest with the people making these games, those people are going to be honest with within their work that they're giving at the end of the day and fully invest in that and gets a better product at the end of, end of the day. I love seeing the art that these people that, you know, these people have made for so long that I, I want the best. I want, I want them to be interested in making this content. I want people to be invested in the content they're making. And if that isn't the way and it's a grind just to get this version of the game out. Cool. If I don't play this game for another three years now or whatever, or if it was going to come out in 2023, if there was a, you know, a slight chance this comes out in 2023. If I got away an extra year or two, cool. If the game's going to be awesome. Cool. That's fine. Like I, that to me says I'm okay, but it's more so about nailing down the vision. I want, even if it's not something that I like at the end of the day and other people dig, that's cool. But I want, commitment to the vision after you find it but don't be afraid to find it find that your confidence in the vision if that means starting over cool that's great and i'm sure that's all talk to shareholders and whatnot at the end of the day for microsoft but microsoft's such a big clung uh, i don't want to say conglomerate but it's such a big entity that eh, you know they have so many multifaceted it's almost like uh it's almost like a couple of other like big players like even Sony, too, to a degree. Granted, Sony's gaming is a much bigger tentpole within that now, but uh, comparative to Microsoft, where Microsoft owns so much mindset in just uh, you know home computers, home computer software, Windows, obviously, then gaming is also is also an entity that they exist in. To us, it's the big thing, but to the vast populace, when people hear Microsoft, they think Windows or something like that. So it's a little di- different from a show- shareholder standpoint, but mostly... I want to find I want this game to find foundation. And cool. Um, like Jeff was saying, Jeff Grubb over at GameSpeed was saying, sure, if we get to see this game in 2023, cool. I'm hoping it's the vision that the development team and everyone is able to kind of sit on and look at and say, yes, this is what we're confident in. This is what we want to develop. That's when you get the most out of this, especially in and it's because for so long now, AAA gaming and the boom of gaming has pushed, especially to if the you know entity is owned by pub- is is public or is owned by a public uh, company, you know a lot of shareholders you got to listen to, and I, and I, to a degree I get that, but at the same time, you're seeing what the same people who you know you look at uh, Nintendo and you look at. A well, Nintendo, probably, but um, you look at a Japanese company. I mean, um, you look at uh, a Sony, and same with them, like they still have people they have to answer to, but you're looking at the investment that they're making in their first party content that's driving console sales, that's driving people to buy, you know, invest in their ecosystem. It comes down to being confident in your content, and if that isn't what your employees are doing, and if you're, you know, heads of the studio and heads of this project are being able to have you buy into that vision. Sure. It is time to look and find a new, you know, foundation to this game. And there's a reason why you can't always just say bullheadedness of no, I'm, I'm battening down the hinge. And like I said, I don't know Dan Neuenberg. I don't know Daryl Gallagher. I don't. So who knows what they're like to interact with or work with or whoever. So, but at the end of the day, Clearly, there is a turnover problem. Clearly, there is a problem from a philosophical standpoint within of your company, of your development studio, you know, whatever you want to call it. So I'm really curious to see how this is going to pan. Uh, I'm really curious to see how this is going to kind of pan out over the next, you know, act- hell, three months, you know, maybe at most until, you know, we see what's coming down the pipe for, uh, Xbox with their summer game showcase probably right around the corner. We're probably going to see, you know, obviously, our first look at Starfield finally. Um, we're probably going to see what's coming with, like I said, uh, Forza Motorsports 8, obviously, or just Forza Motorsports. Now they're kind of just not soft rebooting, but kind of going the God of War direction of this is singular again. And this, you get what I'm saying. But, um, but it's, 
it's really, 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 really interesting to see where this is going to fit in, especially to with like the other uh, three or other two games that this trio has kind of been paired together of Fable, um, Everwild and Perfect Dark of how this is kind of going to pan out with them in conjunction. You know, obviously, like we said, of Everwild potentially being rebooted last year to, um, you know, where Fable is at, really us only having minimal talk around Fable. Really, realistically, Fable probably has the less, and granted, it's because of a well-oiled teen machine, and I'm not saying that in a derogatory way towards any uh, either Rare or uh, Playground games, but you look at Rare, who is just knocking it out of the fucking park right now with um, with Sea of Thieves, and you look at Playground games, who has been churning out excellent titles and progressively better titles each time with uh, Horizon... <laughs> Forza Horizon, I'm all over the place, but you get what I'm saying, where you're, and obviously with Perfect Dark and uh, the initiative being a startup, uh, you know, from the ground up, uh, internal studio that's being built, it's a little different for the, expect. I think, for the expectations of those games and what's coming out of them and yada yada, but for Fable to kind of just be, hey, we're working on it, like, You'll know what we'll, you'll know when we know we're confident to show you this game, and I think that bodes the best so far. That obviously, I think no news some, can sometimes be good news, but who knows? It's just going to be really interesting within the next couple months when we finally get to the traditional E3, and I'm using air quotes on this because I don't think E3 is truly happening this year, from what it sounds like. So who knows? But it's when we finally get to the summer and we start hearing more about you know, Xbox's future plans, um, like I said, with the traditional E3 slot of, hey, the Xbox Summer Game Showcase or whatever. You know, when we see that and we see all of the games coming out soon for Xbox and what's down the pipeline for Microsoft, I'm interested to see if we do see this, you know, if we do actually see Perfect Dark, if we potentially see that, if we see if this is going to be, because I think that'll be a telltale sign if we don't hear anything from Perfect Dark, Maybe it's getting rebooted, you know, maybe it is getting soft rebooted or whatever, you know, maybe the ideology of that game is changing a little bit. So it'll be interesting. And I think that'll be kind of the telltale of where we're at with this game. So that being said, I think that's it. <laughs> kind of a long one for one kind of thing talking about, especially just me talking, rambling, mostly just rambling, I'm sure. But anyways, I think that's going to do it for our episode, at least this week. We'll be back to normal next week. Mike and I will both be back. Our lives will be back to normal um well as normal as i can be but i won't be running around with a, like a chicken with my head cut off um so we'll be we'll be settled in next week i won't be losing my mind next week completely that is at least well, i'm always gonna be losing my mind but you get what i'm saying next week we'll be back to normal we'll have two talking heads out here uh but yeah that's gonna do it for episodes this week as always i'm your host travis white aka travelus on most internet platforms including at travelus underscore on twitter that's t-r-a-v-l-e-s-s underscore you can also find me streaming time to time on twitch.tv slash travelus underscore same as twitter doing some elden ring streams over there um eventually gonna get into some destiny streams again i'd like to get into some some into some 3d art streams and kind of doing some of that as i'm playing around with but i've kind of put that on just for this week i haven't really not really going to touch anything else because I just have so much work this week. Um, but when that settles down and I'm able to actually kind of settle into a consistent stream schedule, um, that's one thing I would like to get back in there. So keep an eye, go check me out on there, go watch the VODs and whatnot. Um, but go over there, follow me and whatnot. So you know when I'm coming and if you want to play games with me, you can do so on most platforms, specific, specifically Xbox Live and whatnot, at just regular old Travelist, T-R-A-V-L-E-S-S. And this, ladies and gentlemen, has been your newest episode of the Game Pass Gamecast, your weekly go-to podcast for all things Xbox, Xbox Game Pass, and of course, PC gaming, including news, rumors, and conversation around them damn good video games. You can catch new episodes of the show when they drop each and every Friday morning on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and all other major podcast services. So, be sure to subscribe to us, rate us, and review us. All the jazz I tell you every week for not on a podcast service, let me know. Your favorite one, you're listening to us, someone else, you're that much of a G, you're listening to us on a serv- on a podcast platform you don't even like, let me know. I'll get on the one you do like. We'll make it happen, my guy. Or girl. You know, guy and girl, gals and girls, you know what I mean. Um, 
But also follow us on Twitter at GPGC Podcast. Stay up to date with everything regarding the show, video games like and our dope giveaways. And with that being said, that's going to do it for episode this week. Thank you everyone so much for listening, sharing, and being a part of our growing community. Game on, wash your hands, listen to the doctors, Black Lives Matter, and we will see you next week. <laughs>